Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me in the back? OK, all right. As my students will tell you, definitely have a plenty big mouth for the most part. So hopefully everybody in the back can hear me. This is such a great group. Thank you so much for coming. So again, my name is Jennifer Frank. Uh, I'm a professor at Penn State. I work in the College of Education in school psychology and special education. And I also work in the Department of Health and Human Development and Biobehavioral Health at Penn State. So really what I'm most interested in and passionate about is prevention research. So a lot of the, I, I focus on school-based programs from a variety of domains. A lot of the things that Mr. Wilson spoke about really resonated with me in terms of socio-emotional learning programs and actually thinking about and doing the day-to-day -day work of figuring out what works to promote many of the things that you were discussing. So what works to promote things like self-management, self-regulation, building healthy relationships. So I don't stick to just one program, but study a variety of programs. And for the last seven years, the Transformative Life Skills Program has been one program that I've been heavily involved in. So BK asked me to come out and talk about some of the research um, that we have been, that we've been finding and some of our findings in those different areas. So, so as a starting point, um, I wanted to start off the first part of this talk about why as a researcher, so somebody whose bread and butter is in studying the effects of these programs, why TLS I think is, is exceptional within the broader uh, arena of different options, different intervention options you can select from. So first of all, it's universal. So what does that mean? So universal means we've studied this program with a lot of different populations, very diverse arrays of grade levels, racial backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, and so far we've found effects in all of these different populations. So it can be applied universally to a lot of different settings. And it's classroom based. So TLS is typically implemented in classroom settings, although we've also had variations in terms of what those classrooms look like, how cramped, how spacious, the nature of the content, and how things are designed. Um, and it's also designed around some core goals. So the goal of the TLS program was to really reduce stress, increase youth adaptive coping skills through instruction in really three core practices. So centering meditation, breath awareness, and yoga, okay? So those are the three practices they refer to as the ABCs. So if you have a chance to look at the curriculum, I'd invite you to do so. Those ABCs, action, breathing, and centering, really form the basis of what we're learning about how this program works, how it evokes its effects. And it's divided up into four units. So the design of this was really designed to, um, to look and feel like a curriculum. That if you're a teacher, if you have some classroom experience, we didn't want to get something that would, that would be difficult to implement, or you would necessarily have to be a yogi, right, to necessarily know how to implement. Certainly a personal practice helps, but clearly I'm not a yogi, right? Clearly I'm not, and maybe you're not either, right? But you don't have to be. So we have trainings associated with this, and it's divided up into really four units, four main outcomes. So stress management, body and emotional awareness, self-regulation, and building healthy relationships. And if you think back to, you know, to, to uh, Mr. Wilson's presentation, it by design maps onto a lot of the collaborative for academic and socio-emotional learning competencies that are trying to build in the socio-emotional learning movement. Okay. So it's typically, de it's delivered, there's some flexibility in delivery, but typically it's, it's implemented as an 18-week semester-long program, right? can be extended across the year if need be. And each unit has about 12 lessons delivered in 15, 30, or 60 minute segments. And this is one of the really neat features of this program is that you know, schools can be really challenging environments. And if they're strapped for anything, it's time. It's time in the day. But you have some options. 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or 60 minutes if you have it. And we found over time, too, in looking at this, that there's certainly a dosage effect. We can achieve significant effects on many domains with just the 15 minutes, you know, every three days, you can, you can get an effect. But the effect increases over time, so it's a dosage effect. The more TLS you get, the bigger the impact. But as little as 15 minutes a day, we do see some movement. All the lesson plans are scripted. We have integrated video demonstrations um, and also fidelity checklists. So these are, this is really about, you know, when you start implementing a program, a lot of you might think, you know, well, how do I know if I did it right? Right? How do I know if I'm actually following the script as intended? So we've developed a lot of different fidelity checklists so that you can look and see at the end of the day if, you're, if, if the program is being implemented as intended. Okay. 
So this is kind of, this is what, uh, what the organization, okay, just real quickly, what the organization of the units look like. So you go through the stress response, physical and emotional awareness, self-regulation, and then healthy relationships. Another really neat design feature, I think, from a, a intervention perspective that a lot of programs don't have is that we recognize your first time around doing this, you're probably not going to get it right. And, or you may get it just right and students might not be present, they, you, they might have missed the class, or maybe it just wasn't taught all that well. Or you think kids, you're, the students that you're teaching need an extra dose of a particular content area. So at the end of each unit, we have built-in lessons that are just an opportunity for teachers to sit down, self-reflect on how things went, and then to select another lesson to reteach and review. So if there's some element that the kids haven't got, you've got built into your schedule now an opportunity to reteach that and, and revisit that skill. Okay. Again, and then there's also linkages. So in coming into this research, Ooh, whoa. <laughs> in coming into this research, a lot of the discussion was about you know, yoga and how to think about yoga as a curriculum, how to make it progressive, like what does it mean to become more difficult? And what we see within the program is we start really simple. We start really simple with simple ideas, simple poses, breathing and centering practices and objectives. And they become, they build on each other and increase over time. Okay. Another nice feature, too, is that these lesson plans are very scripted and very um, include all the information that somebody with just a little bit of training can pick it up and really run with it. So each lesson we talk about what the lesson overview is about. So uh, what kind of poses are you going to be using? What are the potential benefits of it? What is the goal? What are you trying to accomplish with this lesson? What are the main activities? And then what are the optional activities, materials that you need? And then each, uh, this will extend down, but each lesson and timeline you know how long each section is going to take. So if you need to cut something out or move something around, you can really pace yourself and make informed decisions about how you as a teacher choose to spend your time. But it's all laid out. And then this is what the actual content would look like. So if you've been through any of the training programs, like over the last two days, you know, you can see something, um, an exchange being taught over and over again, but it's sometimes hard to find the words. So what we did is we manualized this with um, scripted lesson plans so that you didn't have to stumble over your words and trying to explain how to teach somebody how to do this, right? There's sample lessons, um, there, there's sample language embedded in each lesson that you can walk through. And it'll take you through that process so you don't have to wonder. Another really nice part of the curriculum, too, again, from a research perspective, is it's pretty comprehensive. So one of the things that has been built in is a student workbook. And within that workbook, really, the vision was to create a series of activities that reinforce and extend what the students are learning, but also to include an element of actual academic activities and skills that support the lessons. So we might have an activity where um, when we talk about stress, when we talk about the effects of stress within the body, we might have students do and then discuss as a group um, uh, you know, a diagram of where they feel stress in their body, right? Where it's typically felt. Um, or over time, we might ask them to chart their stress levels over time and then talk about that, right? This is an optional piece of the curriculum, so, but th there's a lot of value added if teachers are able to adopt it. Okay, and again, this is just real quickly, you know, we built in fidelity, right? So we want people to be able to improve their skills over time, be reflective on their own practice. So this is built in as a part of the, of the intervention itself. And then Naroga also has a lot of different supplemental components, right? So we have a variety of CDs and DVDs, things that kids can use to build on what they've learned. And by the way, you may have noticed my, my PowerPoint slides have a vine growing through them randomly, and it's taken, what, two PhDs, and somebody with a PhD in computer science hasn't figured it out yet. So if it pops up, <laughs> you know what's going on. It's like a little fungus growing throughout the PowerPoints. Today's not my day. I can just tell you that. All right. So, um, and, you know, I also think, you know, TLS is also really exceptional in terms of thinking about multimedia and taking advantage of what kids actually do, how they connect to build onto the program. So there's all different kinds of YouTube channels, iTunes channels, there's, a, there's a, um, uh, an app for the iPad. And then this is what it looks like in practice, right? 
So what's been amazing is folks implementing this in the schools within this area have been able to have significant effects in a variety of classrooms. So when I first started doing this work, I thought, how in the world would anybody be able to do yoga in a cramped classroom? But they do. They can make adaptations for really tight spaces and still get effects. Certainly if you have enough space and enough time, there's a map-based version of the program, which is fantastic, but you need not have that. So, so good things can happen in very small places. Okay, and there's also videos, right? So if you haven't had a chance to check out the website, it's a fantastic website. There's lots of videos, um, interviews with former principals and individuals that, and teachers, students, who have implemented the TLS program. And you can kind of, you can just see these really great multimedia presentations and hear testimonials of folks that have implemented this in practice. Also, the last part here, this is kind of new, so, um, which, but I think is really exciting. In addition to this curriculum, there's vi there, we're developing video supplements, right? So instead of just reading about how to implement this in practice, you can actually watch it be demonstrated and practice with these video-based demonstrations where an instructor will go through a lesson or key components of a lesson and demo how it should look, right? How, what you should say, how you should say it, how you should hold your body. And you can then mimic that and review it as many times as you need be as you're adapting. Okay, so here's, here's what I think is, is a really exciting part. So, so that's, that's the basic curriculum. That's what we're studying. Um, it's evolved over time. It's really exciting. I think it's really very much becoming a model program. So uh, we just completed, we're really happy we just completed our first round of review from the Collaborative of Socio-Emotional Learning that reviews evidence-based programs. And we finished that, so that was great. So it's a big milestone for us. But it, it speaks to the fact that we have just enough research and really good program design to be considered, to be amongst these you know, top programs. So it's a, it's a researcher's dream to be able to study something like this. So I'm going to talk with you real quickly about um, the findings from a series of the last four studies that we've done. Take you through it really quickly. And if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or, or let me know. Um, for those of you, I see a couple familiar faces. So if you were in the trainings yesterday, there will be no dolphins with lasers on their heads. OK, so, so that's just for you. That was just for you, these guys. <laughs> You see, it should have been to the training. See, yeah, there's laser beams, dolphins with laser beams on their heads. So anyway, so the first study we did is a randomized control trial, right? So in my field, this is considered to be as good as it gets, right? So we have, what our goal was here was to investigate whether exposure to transformative life skills program had an impact on kids' school engagement, socio-emotional well-being, and we looked at youth in a, a urban high school setting, right? Uh, we had a sample of about 100, 159 students in grades 6 and 9, and it was a diverse charter school setting, okay? So classrooms are randomly assigned to a treatment or weightless control condition, so just business as usual. And we've, we measured a variety of things. So what we're interested in is, and we're still learning about how to evaluate this program and what kind of measures this class of intervention is most sensitive to. But we measured a couple things that we think that school administrators, teachers, students, and parents are going to be most interested in. So we're interested in school engagement. So are kids coming to school? Are they enjoying school? Are they active? Are they involved? We measured their attitudes towards violence, right? Are they pro or con violence? And if so, at to what level? Where do they fall in that continuum? We measured positive affect and negative affect, so just general affective skills. And then we also uh, looked at somatization. So somatization is um, a general sense of uh, how well you feel. If you experience any kind of somatic complaints, like stomach aches, headaches, um, pains in your back, you know, a lot of stress-related symptomology, physiology in your body that doesn't really have a source. So you're not sick, you don't have the flu, but you just don't feel well. You have a lot of aches and pains. We also were interested in responses to stress. So how children coped with the stress that they felt. So whether or not they engaged in primary stress and coping behaviors, like, for example, um, uh, real specific coping strategies, behavioral coping strategies, or more secondary coping strategies. So rethinking the way that you think about your stress. So we measure both of those things. And then we looked at extant student records, things that really matter in terms for schools and accountability. We looked at unexcused absences, detention, suspension rates, and we also looked at grades in mathematics and English. And then finally, we actually asked the kids, how well did you like the program? 
okay? <laughs> and we, we administer the children's intervention rating scale. And how does this intervention compare to other things you've been a part of? And this is the exciting part. So this is a lot of statistical stuff. So we, in the results, we controlled for grade, gender, and race. Not a whole lot, but we controlled for that. Uh, we did the statistics right. We did them uh, pretty conservatively. We had very little dropout. So we didn't have a situation where kids in the treatment group dropped out. We had 20 kids in the treatment group drop out and none in the control group. It was pretty balanced between the two. And there was no differences on any of the measures. So the groups that we randomized were equivalent, which is pretty key. This is what we found. So yellow is good. <laughs> this is a big table. And if you'd like the slides, I'd be happy to send them to you. Um, we can make those available. But here's what you've got. We've got the mean at post for the treatment group and the control group. Those are the actual means. And over here, we have the p-values, which is, is it significant, right? Does it, is it really significant? And then over on this side here is what we call effect size. So does it matter? And in education, you know, anything above a four effect size is fantastic. It's really important. So significance means, you know, is it replicable? Is it a solid finding? Does this really matter? Do these differences matter? But effect size is like, is it important? How, how big are the group differences? And as you can see, it's pretty exciting. We had both significant and important decreases in the control group and the number of excused absences, the number of detentions, and also significant improvements over time and important improvements in their self-reported school engagement. Suspensions, we didn't have any significant effects on, but a lot of factors go into suspension. So we're still looking at that and we're gonna you know, rethink that and, and what that's about. English and math grades too is another aspect that we're thinking about. So um, we didn't find, we found everything was in the right direction, we didn't find significant effects, but we're thinking about what it's gonna take to make to branch into achievement. Attitudes towards violence, we had significant decreases in, um, within the treatment group. So kids started endorsing violence less as a viable option, which is a really exciting finding. We also had significant increases. So as they stopped um, endorsing violence, we also saw significant increases in their primary and secondary stress coping strategies. So in addition to adopting some of the skills they learned through the TLS program, they also started engaging in healthy stress coping behaviors in other ways, right? So it's kind of like one good begot many other goods. Okay, we measured a lot of things, <laughs> so stick with me here. Uh, emotion regulation, the children's emotion regulation, self-reported emotion regulation increased as well, as did their positive thinking and cognitive restructuring. So cognitive restructuring is one of those elements where you start, um, you, when you're faced with a problem, you sort of restructure it, you reframe it for yourself in order to move forward. It's considered to be a positive coping strategy. So we got significant and important effects on both of those domains. So this was a very um, comprehensive and um, I think exciting study, you know, for us as a preliminary first step. So on this second, the second study, we looked at at-risk kids, specific at-risk kids. So this was the general population in study one. Study two, our goal was to investigate whether exposure to TLS was equally effective on more indicators of mental health, right, and well-being in a high-risk youth attending an alternative school, okay? Uh, here we had a sample of 49 students in grades 9 through 11 in a diverse altern alternative school. About 54% were female, and it was um, African American, about 33% African American, 33% Hispanic. Um, so it was highly diverse uh, group composition. And we had a pre-post design. We also monitored fidelity to make sure that the intervention was implemented as intended and uh, make sure that everything was right. And we had really great findings there. So it was implemented as intended by about 95%. So that not only tells us we can trust our results, but that also folks can do this in schools, right? For with minimal training, folks can do this. So here we measured, again, affect, but this time, for kids that are at risk, we were also interested in depression, anxiety, hostility, global mental health symptomology. We were interested in things like rumination, intrusive thoughts, emotional arousal, involuntary action, the indicators of PTSD and associated stress. We were also interested in this um, idea of transgression-related interpersonal motivations. So this is kind of a new idea um, that how, how, to what extent do children endorse the idea that vengeance is good? Do you know what I mean, do, right? You probably, a lot of you can relate to that. Um, and that, that vengeance is a good thing and something that should be pursued. So again, 
Uh, the statistics, you know, we did pretty conservative statistics um, pre-post tests, had very low attrition levels, less than six kids dropped out, and then this is what we found. Uh, what we found, again, significant and important reductions in clinical levels of anxiety. We found significant and important reductions in clinical levels of depression and also global mental health symptomology. Then across the board here, we found um, significant reductions in involuntary engagement in intrusive thoughts, um, involuntary actions. Thank you. <laughs> Rumination, so the, the, the symptomology associated with PTSD went down, intrusive thoughts, and also physical arousal went down, as did emotional arousal. So this is, this is suggesting that the things amongst traumatized children that can be the most problematic interfere with their learning. TLS was a significant force in reducing that for this group. And then lastly, vengeance motivation, children's endorsement of um, Revenge as, an, as a viable option also significantly decreased and substantially decreased. So if you remember, point four is a cut of when it's really important in, in many school trials, and we had a reduction of point eight, as did hostility. So their, their actual hot reported at number of hostile acts. So those are the two school studies I wanted to show to you, share with you today. Then we have two additional briefer but really important studies um, where we implemented uh, TLS in juvenile justice settings. So the first study was a pre-post design of 77 youth offenders in a co-ed psychiatric facility. So here again, you know, 62% female, a very diverse sample, predominantly African American, but also 37% Caucasian, 10% Hispanic. And again, we had significant reductions after receiving TLS in this really difficult setting. We had significant and important reductions in their perceived stress and also concurrent increases in their levels of self-control. And compared to the six months prior, the children who participated in the TLS group had reported significantly fewer major disciplinary violations. So within the ward, every disciplinary um, action is recorded, and these children had significantly fewer than those that didn't, that didn't receive TLS. And then the very last study, so given those promising findings in the juvenile justice setting, then we also had a randomized control trial with 76 offenders in a male-only juvenile facility. Um, this, this was a maximum security setting, so these are really tough kids with real significant issues. And participants were assigned in this case to receive either TLS or an exercise control. So you could either go to yoga or you could go and you could do some exercise and weightlifting. Um, again, 100% male, very similar uh, racial composition. And after we statistically controlled again for age and race, we saw the same findings with this really tough group of kids. Significantly lower levels of, of perceived stress, and also we had significant improvements, so children saw themselves as having um, higher levels of self-control. We also saw significantly fewer disciplinary referrals as well. So the same theme is being replicated again and again. So this is very exciting. So, you know, what, so a take home from this, so there's a lot of different take homes from this, but TLS is a really promising intervention for enhancing several aspects of youth well-being, socio-emotional functioning, socio-emotional learning. Um, and we've been successful in implementing this and finding effects in regular, alternative, and juvenile justice detention settings. There's a high degree of acceptability, so people like the program, and it's feasible to implement. People can do this program with success. Overall, if you, if you add it up across the studies, we have really good news, right? So we have good empirical evidence and replication of the fact that we have statistically significant reductions in unexcused absences, detention, increases in school engagement, anxiety, depression, global psychological distress, rumination, intrusive thoughts, physical arousal, emotional arousal, perceived stress, disciplinary refractions, reduced hostility, reduced endorsement of revenge motivation interventions, and response to inter interpersonal transgressions. We also have statistically significant improvements, so growth in emotion regulation, positive thinking, and cognitive restructuring in response to stress, and also perceived self-control. So things that we want to go down are going down, and things that we want to go up are going up. And that's really good news from my perspective. Now, so far we haven't found effects on somatization, um, suspensions, academic grades, or general affect. And I think we're starting to learn why, right? I think that we have a sense of why that's happening. So it's not a complete panacea, 
but it's pretty darn good and one of the best I've ever had the pleasure to work with. So I see I have five minutes, so that's it. Thank you.